inform you that Estonian Foreign Intelligence Service has focused on Russia for the last 25 years and seems that the focus will stay on Russia. And I always say that the focus will change when Russia will become a fully democratic and friendly nation. So most probably I will keep my job for, for a few more years. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> but uh, just to give the perspective how we see uh, Russia in this region, I, I, I'm sure that my um, Baltic services will agree me, with me, but uh, we think in, in a Soviet Foreign Intelligence Service that Russia is the only uh, potential security threat in the Baltic Sea region and on NATO's eastern border. Well, I, and I think that over the last years, over the last 25 years, we have acquired pretty good knowledge about uh, Russia, pretty good knowledge about Russia's uh, operations. Um, and you might know that we have been publishing the public threat assessment for the last three years. It, will be, it is available on our website, fis.ee, and tomorrow morning it will be also available somewhere in the building, so you have to spy around and, and, and see where it is. But we have been doing that in order to, to raise the awareness and to, to share a bit of our knowledge with, uh, with the outsider audience. And uh, I think it was a year ago when we also uh, got a very good feedback from uh, Kremlin media. Uh, they said that uh, in, in these reports, public reports, Estonian Foreign Intelligence Service knows the Kremlin's plans even before the Kremlin does. <laughs> wow! <laughs> well, you, you cannot have better compliment for an uh, Intel service that is focusing on, on Russia. And uh, right now we have a discussion whether to, to make it an unofficial slogan of the service or, <laughs> or not. But it was, it was very good to hear that, that kind of feedback. Well, uh, now coming to the point, uh, the, the elections. I think that the Kremlin's meddling in, in the Western elections has been um, quite extensively covered uh, during the last um, two or so years. And one might think that maybe as Russia's activities are exposed, uh, it will deter Russia uh, and they will not do it again. Um, I, I, I will assure you that it has not deterred Russia. They will, they will do it again. Uh, and we will see more, it, more of it. Uh, but we, before I go into the, the real matter, I will take, take a step back for a moment and look at how we have come so far. How has Russia, a country that's having a declining economy, its declining economic power, been able to influence internal politics in democratic uh, countries? Um, and over the, over, the, over the last years, I think that the international community has been focusing on Russia, on Russia and how Russia has used the different uh, social media tools, be it bots on Twitter or bots on, on Facebook or ads on Facebook. And I think that exposing those activities in social media is, is really, really important. However, uh, according to our assessment, this is not the core. This is not the core of Kremlin's influence strategy. I think the core of Kremlin's influence strategy is to influence elections before the elections actually take place. This is the best possible solution, to, to influence elections before elections, to influence humans that are actually, at the end of the day, doing the, the final decision. So I think that it's not, it's not just about twisting the polls but it's about influencing the politics in, in general. And we, we see that during the last years, and even way back, the Russia has uh, focused on creating network of, uh, I would say, influence agents. And when you ask me for a definition for influence agents, I would call an influence agent a person who can use his or her status or access to influence the decision-making in, in Europe, in the United States, in, in, in other countries, and who are directed to do it by, by Russia. Uh, we have detected that, especially in, in Europe, the Putin's regime has developed quite an extensive network of politicians, 
quite an extensive network of journalists, uh, also academics and, and diplomats, who are acting in Kremlin's interests. And we have seen how the, the Kremlin has put a, a great deal of effort to create this uh, network of pro-Russian politicians in the European Union. And Russia has invested, invested quite widely. Uh, they have focused on um, old faces, uh, on uh, new faces. They have been investing into people from the far light, uh, right and to the, to the far left. Um, they have been focusing and investing into people uh, in the EU level, as well as into the representatives of uh, local governments and national governments and regional um, uh, leadership bodies. And w what, what Kremlin is, is, is offering, actually they are not offering to these people anything, anything really special. They are offering what usual human beings slash politicians usually want. Basically, they want attention. So Russia provides these politicians media coverage, um, and especially extensive media coverage in, in uh, Russia's state-owned media outlets. Um, they offer exclusive business accesses, be it in Russia or in Crimea. They offer high-level meetings uh, with Russian businessmen, with Russian politicians that can again be used in, in media coverage and that can be used then again in their countries of, of origin. And last but not least, Russia has also been providing uh, financial support. Well, I, I would say also that not all the investments that Russia has made or the Kremlin has made during the last years have, have been paying off really well. I think that they have had some really bad investments, but at the same time, I think that Russia has had really good investments. Um, so, for example, politicians who a few years ago acted on the margins of their domestic uh, politics have now become part of mainstream. Uh, in some countries, those people are part of uh, uh, their parliaments, uh, even governments. We see how these people are now promoting Russia's interests, either by calling for an improvement in uh, relations with Russia or calling for ending sanctions on, on Russia. And these people are the critical enablers of information operations, helping to spread this information propaganda. And I already predict that you, you might want to, to hear some, some good examples, because always when an Intel guy is speaking, he's saying about uh, grand things, but not bringing in I any examples. This time, since it's, it's a very small crowd of people and uh, a trusted network of friends, I will bring you two examples. Uh, I will not name any names, but I have two examples for, for you. So first example is a parliament member of a European country who a few years ago visited Russian-occupied Crimea on a trip paid by Kremlin. Soon after the trip to Crimea, the politician lobbied actively for lifting the sanctions on Russia. The polit politician later asked the Kremlin for financial and media support for elections campaigning. In exchange, the politician promised to take European opinion leaders to Crimea, and the politician is an active distributor of Kremlin's narratives today. Second example, uh, another politician in another country is promoting business relations with Russia. The politician has organized several delegations of politicians and business people to uh, Russian-occupied Crimea, where they have been promised uh, very exclusive business opportunities in Russia. And this politician is actively working towards lifting the san sanctions on, on Russia. But I have to say, I have to stress that these are only some examples, only two examples from a wider picture that we are detecting every, every day. And I would like to stress that Russia is playing a, a, long, a longer game. So they are constantly spotting talent, be it uh, from the marginal uh, political parties or from, uh, from the youth conferences that are currently organized by Russians, Russia's embassies around the world. 
So with a network of influence agents in place, the Kremlin is able to influence everyday politics in, in Europe. And I think that when they have this well-established network in place, they do not actually, actually need to interfere in the election process itself. So finally, what can we do about it? So trying to answer, Bob, your, 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 your questions that you posed us in the beginning of, of this panel. I have four solutions for you. First of all, stop it, expose it to raise awareness, and fourthly, we should cooperate more. Uh, so just adding one sentence to, to each uh, of those solutions. So first of all, I think that Western governments have the tools to be used in order to stop uh, Russian activities. I think that the Western communities, the Western governments should be uh, stronger, bolder when using the uh, possibilities they, they have in hand. And I think that we should not be too much thinking about maybe we are provoking Russia too much. I think that's a very common idea in, in European capitals. Maybe we do a bit too much. Uh, and I would uh, uh, like to uh, uh, draw your attention to the report that was written by uh, SIPA uh, a few weeks ago uh, by uh, Peter Doran and Don, Don Jensen. Um, and they definitely uh, said that we should not prioritize Putin's peace of mind. So we shouldn't be afraid of that. So secondly, uh, to expose the activities. I think that um, when the activities or the influence agents are exposed, it's really difficult to operate covertly uh, from that point on. Thirdly, we have to raise the public awareness. I think that's the point where we intelligence people and, and you communications people should do more. Uh, I think we have done our bit, uh, me being in this conference, uh, us in the Estonian Foreign Intelligence Service issuing the public threat assessment. This is part of the raising of awareness. But I think that uh, having articles in newspapers, having interviews, having uh, the this, this spotlight on the activities that Russians are doing is, 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 is a great way to, uh, to hinder their operations. And fourthly, cooperate. I think that European and uh, Western intelligence services should do more. I think that we have to share information uh, more quickly uh, because probably what is happening right now in some other part of Europe might happen in my country. What is happening in my country can in few months happen in Latvia or some other country in Europe or, or in the United States. So sharing that information and discussing what to do about it is, is, is the key, key subject. So uh, in case you slept during my... Uh, very short intervention. Uh, to sum it up, uh, Kremlin wants the West to be weak and divided. Uh, the Kremlin will keep on disrupting the West. And it's now our choice whether we let Kremlin succeed or we act in our defense. And I would definitely support the latter. Thank you. Thank you, Nick.